it is my privilege uh, to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for this lecture on Reconstructing Rage. Uh, this event has been in the making for almost about six months, uh, Dr. Price Bradley. Um, this is a very timely topic. Uh, this isn't a topic that should go away. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing the words that uh, Dr. Price Bradley is going to share with us. Uh, Dr. Townsend Price Spratlin is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at The Ohio State University. He studies historical and contemporary community capacity building, which is the means by which local area assets are brought together to improve the quality of life. Dr. Price Spratlin's work focuses on how community and organizational practices shape demographic, health, wellness, and, ju and social justice outcomes. In his historical work, he explored how the NAACP activism and other assets of urban destinations helped shape the great migration of African Americans across the 20th century. His contemporary work analyzes how community organizations inform faith, health, and civic engagement. This work includes the impact of faith-based organizations on relationships between post-prison re-entry, substance abuse recovery, and well-being. His book, Reconstructing Rage, uh, Transformed Free Entry in the Air of Mass Incarceration. Please hold on to your raffle tickets because we will be raffling off his book. Um, and if you already have a copy, you can give yours to, my, to me. Um, but his book analyzes how grassroots reentry organizations, how, how a grassroots reentry organization, Reconstruction Incorporated, has helped many returning citizens established and sustained crime-free lives across a generation. The book demonstrates how to build community capacity with former felons at the core of an organization's leadership. He has been a member of Reconstruction Incorporated since the organization began and now serves on the advisory board. Uh, please give Dr. Price Bratman a warm round of applause. Good evening. Yeah. Thanks to each of you for coming out. Um, this is a bit impromptu, and I hope this um, is okay by you. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home. Um, just before Easter, early this year, um, I know we, a family, um, lost my mom, um, Dr. Lois Weissman. Um, she passed away comfortably, um, and that's heartening, if such a thing could be heartening. Um, Mom, she, she is a presence in this room. Um, she's a presence with me always. Um, and I celebrate doing justice by her, by celebrating justice in fellowship with y'all. Let's get going. One of the individuals who is sort of doing a revolving door kind of thing um, has yet to be able to consistently maintain a crime-free life. He's currently locked up, and I made an effort to get him in touch with a family member. In the, in the course of that phone call, he thought he was going to just be in touch with his brother, trying to get money on his books. Folks who have anybody who's locked up knows the drama related to that. Um, but surprisingly, his brother was up in a town where they're from in Ohio. And his mother was there, and his grandmother was there. And so the, his brother handed his, the phone to his mother. 
how you doing? They had their exchange of mother and son. And then the mother held the phone, handed the phone to his grandmother. Very much a surprise. And her, it was a, it was a powerful moment just to be in three-way fellowship um, with this uh, with this conversation. And I share it with you tonight because the grandmother asked him, "Are you going to do right this time? Are you going to do right this time?" And I share that question with you because it is my sincere hope that individually and collectively we can be of assistance in helping that young man keep his promise to his grandmother. He said, yes, yes, grandma. This time, I'm going to do right by you. Um, so let's move forward informed by the idea that each of us can make a contribution to assisting that young man keep his promise to his grandmother. Um, let's, let me outline the presentation first, and then I'll outline the book. Um, the presentation will first focus on an overview of the book, and uh, then I'll get into then I'll get into uh, mass incarceration at the global, national, and local levels. Get into some of the details of what Reconstruction Incorporated does to engage its mission at the cultural, community, and capacity building levels. And then uh, end with um, a note of hope, a note of hope as we move forward into a possible era of the decline of mass incarceration. We can only hope it has begun. Um, rage. Why reconstructing rage? In Reconstruction, rit ritual, reciprocity, and rage are intersecting resources that together enable resilience. Ritual, reciprocity, and rage are intersecting resources that together enable resilience and enrich capacity building outcomes. William, the words of my co-author and the founder of the organization, William Goldsby. First of all, rage. Rage is an emotion. It is a real strong emotion. And there's a lot of passion behind it. I don't think anybody can actually control their emotions but they can intelligently respond to their emotions. So the notion to remove it, or the notion to tell people to not exercise their rage would not be very effective. So the people that was on the advisory board and myself agreed with identifying all the emotions that was a part of the participants in the program. The joys, the happiness, the pain, but more importantly, identify what are the actual experiences people had in their past that resulted in their rage. To deny that is to deny those experiences. So the idea was to unite with those experiences. To identify them with clarity. Whether you've been hungry in your life. Whether you've been raped or you've been abused, or you've been disrespected, silenced. All of those are experiences that bring one to act out violently. The reason for not removing rage, one, is that you cannot remove it. Instead, dissect it, and then put it in its historical place. To understand how we have been arrested in our emotions, at what point we're arrested in our emotions. To understand it and to begin to look at those emotions both objectively and subjectively is rationalizing those emotions. Because you recognize that someone has disrespected you or your family. You recognize that, excuse, sorry, excuse me, the need is there because your family is going without because you recognize that someone has disrespected you or your family very violently. You don't commit a violent offense 
against people or the community because you're able to be intelligent about what you feel. Your feelings are very present, but you are not a slave to those feelings. We'll explore that further as we move on, but I wanted to introduce you to the reason behind the book's title um, that is informed by that level of emotional awareness and the use of rage as a fundamental passion-driven resource for transformation and beneficial change. And then we'll end with your questions and some discussion. So I gotta get through this so we can get to your discussion. Because it's really a dialogue in fellowship where, where true transformation occurs. Um, okay, let's get the book over here. Um, first, three primary themes are the book's focus. Culture, community, and capacity building. Culture, strategies of action, primary material and symbolic resources that inform patterns of exchange and the structure and dynamics of human interaction. Community, patterns of fellowship as place and process. Capacity building, all, all manner of effort to bring resources together in fellowship to further individual, familial, and collective ends. Culture, community, capacity building. In part one of the book, the first three chapters address the culture theme, focus on the culture theme by emphasizing rage and resilience, the relationship between them. Focusing on the, uh, curriculum development, the formative development of the curriculum that was fundamental to the organization's development, Reconstruction Incorporated, and in the first five years of the organization. Part two of the book focuses on the theme of community. The second five years of the organization, women's experiences and youth's experiences within the organization. And part three focuses on capacity building. The next 10 years of the organization, actually up until today. Um, and then recent best practices and summary some, and this provides a summary of future collaborations. I am struggling. Let me, let me violate the fourth wall. I'm struggling. I should have put the, I, I printed these out in way too small an image. So I, if I have to turn away from y'all to watch the screen, please forgive me because I just don't have it clearly enough for my eyes to see vividly in front of me on this on the piece of paper. So I just need to say that. I don't realize this is a, this is a reach. Okay. Um, so that's what the book focuses on. Now that we've addressed the, the, the relevance of rage, and we'll talk about that further, giving you a sense, thumbnail sketch, of the book and its primary themes, I want to make sure that you're clear on the context in which the book was written, the era, sometimes the era of mass incarceration that we are in. First I'll place that globally, then I'll place it nationally, and then I'll give a local flair. Globally. The United States is the global leader in locking people up, as many of us already know. Um, the only countries that come close are Russia and Rwanda. If you are the company you keep, then one might raise question about what commentary that makes about us as a nation. Um, and I don't know. As well, about us as a nation, we can talk about that further if you like. Um, but look at the comparisons of nation states that are that view ourselves as comparable to us, the rest of Europe and the like, and ones that we point fingers at related to human rights violations, in particular China, and its rate relative to ours. The United States is about 5% of the globe's population, and it contains approaching one quarter of all incarcerated persons. Global context of mass incarceration. U.S. is the global leader. Um, let's recognize that that process of mass incarceration um, is inequitably distributed. 
and the relative prevalence or probability of being incarcerated is heavily informed by one's racial or ethnic affiliation. Bar chart um, from the uh, policy, um, Prison Policy Institute, um, 2010 data in race. Um, African American uh, incarceration rate per 100,000, Latino rate per 100,000, and white rate per 100,000. Um, the extreme disproportionate proportionality. So the bar that you saw before is, is masks this level of rather substantial differences depending upon what the racial or ethnic affiliation. And that has catastrophic consequences potentially because it's also neighborhood concentrated. Uh, individuals are not imprisoned from, di distributed widely or evenly across all neighborhoods. It's concentrated in selected neighborhoods. And that neighborhood concentration further magnifies not just the individual consequences, but the collective and communal consequences in very negative ways. Okay. Um, now place <laughs> now place it in the US instead of state context. Map of the United States, states operating at relative to capacity. The darkest states are the states that are operating at a prison capacity in 2005 data of 140% or more. 40% above capacity. 40% above full. And there are nine such states, and we live in one of them. Now, that's 2005 data. I just checked recently, earlier today, just to update that. And actually, we're down now just above 130, about 132. So we're now below the 140 threshold um, as of, 2000, of late 2010 data. But still, um, a, a, level of, uh, a level of prevalence that might give one pause. Certainly gives me. Um, so, global context, um, ethno-racial variation, and national comparative context. Okay. There is a strategy to change that. And each of us can participate within it, um, depending upon our choices and decisions. Let's talk about that strategy for change as chronicled and represented um, in the book and as engaged in by the organization Reconstruction Incorporated. Um, community capacity building, so sorry, to get you, to give you a greater appreciation of community capacity building's relevance to the process of mass incarceration and reentry. Um, I share with you the question raised by researcher James Lynch, who asks, can specific programs affect levels of social integration among released persons enough to affect the quality of life for themselves and their family and to reduce their criminal involvement. Can programs do that? Can organizations and programs within organizations do that? Answer, yes. Yes. And Reconstruction is a living, breathing example because it seeks to maximize individual assets, familial assets, and communal assets. An asset is anything that one does well, any skill that one has, any resource that one can bring to bear, an asset. And one can, in, in fellowship with one another, um, nurture those assets to further collective ends. And we'll talk about the how of that asset maximization process as we move forward to it. Yes, a grassroots former felon-led um, and founded organization can through nurturing transformation. Bring assets together, bring assets together among other individuals in fellowship with one another, and change happens. Powerful, powerful change happens. Faith informed, though highly secular. We'll talk further about that. Okay, so I've been using the, the reference time and time again. Let me give you an introduction to Reconstruction Incorporated. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Anybody familiar with Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? Okay, we got some folks. 
um, North Philadelphia, the North Central um, area. It's the Tioga neighborhood. Um, and we're, we're, you know, some organizational or neighborhood ethnographies choose uh, anonymity. We chose not for a variety of reasons. It's, it's North Philadelphia, it's Tioga, it's at the northwestern edge of Temple University, um, for those who have a, a geographic sense um, of Philadelphia. Um, Reconstruction Incorporated was named and formed by the legacy of the transformative period at the end of chattel slavery, when, which is understood as a revolutionary period in this country's history in the 19th century, where there was a question, what does black citizenship mean? Who are these people? And how will they be, they be engaged as citizens within the society? Reconstruction was a transformative period that ended very brutally in 1877 with the presidency of Brother Ruby Hayes and the Southern Compromise and a bunch of history that we, won't, we don't have time to get into today. Um, but Reconstruction bears its name from the desire to further a transformation. Because as we know from Michelle Alexander's chosen title, the, mass, the year of mass incarceration is the new Jim Crow. And of course we know Jim Crow as a historical era followed Reconstruction um, as a period of um, solidified second class citizenship on the part of African Americans, reinforced by a Supreme Court decision in 1896. Um, so Reconstruction bears its name from that era. Rooted in and founded on the sacred circle, which is understood the circle as symbol and as process of resource exchange, um, rooted in the continental African and First Nation traditions. The focus is on emphasizing respect, reciprocity, and consensus building as the primary means for both decision making and structural change. All we can, and I can only begin to describe how laborious some reconstruction meetings are because William Goldsby, its founder, is a stickler for adhering to this principle. So for example, in a meeting, everybody's voice must be heard. You know, five-year-old kid, three-year-old kids, what, what you got to say? And we wait until that child gets, gets up enough gumption and a bunch of in a room full of strangers to say something. Elders. The, the, the oldest and the youngest speak for the, the, you know, a, a bunch of traditions are adhered to, rooted in and formed by the sacred circle. And it makes some meetings very, very challenging, but extraordinarily rich. And um, so, reconstruction. Um, and we need to be clear William Goldsby is my co author and himself a two time violent felon. Um, did, served his time in the late 60s and early 70s, um, in part military prison, part outside in, state, in a state institution, um, and moved to Philadelphia for a reason that I'll describe in a bit. So let me get into a bit of Reconstruction's history. <coughs> um, Reconstruction was founded in 1988 um, by William and a group of interested others. Um, and. The AFSC there stands for the American Friends Service Committee, which is a long-standing Quaker organization um, that, root, that is rooted very squarely in nurturing social justice outcomes. It was incorporated independently. It started as a program within AFSC and incorporated independently three years after it, was, after it began in 1991. Um, it is a family-centered and intergenerational organization. Um, individuals don't just come as individuals, or they may, but soon family members are in fellowship um, across generations um, so that the recognition of shared leadership within the organization is reflected shared leadership within families and the communities. Um, it collaborates with various forms of resource exchange with the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, uh, that's for abbreviation, or also other social justice organizations, including Bread and Roses, and other elements of the criminal justice system, including um, an affiliate of Reconstruction, strong advocate in the Philadelphia um, District Attorney's Office. Um, and its three primary programs are fight, FFL, or Fight for Lifers, AEA, or Alumni Ex-Offender Association, 
and lead leadership, education, advocacy, and development. I'll have more to say about each of those programs in a minute. Just want to give you a bit of the context. Since local place matters, this organization founded by former felons in fellowship with interested others, led by former felons and their family members and interested others, is taking place and engaging in these changes for sustained crime-free lives in this type of neighborhood. A neighborhood of significant concentrated poverty, hyper poverty. Um, there's nearly two out of five households, 38.6%, nearly two out of every five households in the neighborhood are in poverty, compared with uh, one out of five um, within Philadelphia, the city as a whole. Um, is overwhelmingly African American um, compared to those, those uh, percentages as a whole. Um, and it is a high crime neighborhood, whether it's whether we're talking about violent crime or the drug related crime. That's the environment um, that reconstruction operates within and contributes directly to. And it does those contributions, engages in those contributions by effective grassroots organizing, the primary pillars of which we can't go in, I can't go into um, in great detail tonight, but I want to introduce you to um, the idea of this representation reflected in the civil participatory changes pyramid of eight vital resources for effective grassroots organizing, very much described in great detail within Reconstructing Rage the Tech. So reintegration is the primary focus of Reconstructing Rage. Individuals coming out of jail, coming out of prison, returning to community, what then? Thus reintegration, inclusion back into community. And it begins with reentry, the exit from institution. It's further with all, through all eight resources, enriching that process of sustained Reintegration. And again, rage is a vital means not to, not to be denied, minimized, or ignored, but to be acknowledged overtly as a fundamental, passionate resource um, that can be combined with those building lines and forming each of them to nurture and further transformative reentry. Individual change, familial change communal change happens. Small scale, but it's happening. Um, um, here's a recent picture from a, it's on a reconstruction website um, from an uh, um, annual meeting a couple years ago. And let me share with you the vision statement of the organization. Um, let's see. Um, regardless of one's past, we value each voice being informed by equal access to education, legal rights, health care, and comprehensive political participation. We recognize the excellence in every human being and facilitate a process where our members, along with members of affected, excuse me, of allied organizations, value their own potential and realize it. Uh, when this is true, that person is prevented from being a commodity to be auctioned off by the prison industrial complex. When individuals realize their own genius, are brought into fellowship with others seeking to nurture the genius within themselves and in fellowship with others, the, the likelihood of bad acts goes down because investment in realizing that genius, individually and collectively, goes up. Easy words to say, more complicated terrain to actually navigate um, across the day. And we'll talk about some examples of what does and does not work as we move forward. But I wanted to give you a sense of the, that critical pillar reflected here of mission and vision, which is the cornerstone of the foundation of the Thus, I share the vision um, of the organization. Okay, driven by a curriculum, and it is that curriculum that is the appendix that is in the appendix um, of the book. 
and I want to just read you the first paragraph from the curriculum that drives, dri structured around three pillars that each organizational program, each organizational member seeks to understand and further. Now, at times, I can't, I've been affiliated with your organization across, all, it's all of you, and I don't necessarily remember, I can't, certainly can't recite that stuff word for word. So these are individuals at different reading levels, um, and different educational backgrounds, different reasons, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's a guiding set of principles that inform patterns of engagement and action, not an expectation to be able to recite off the top of your head. Um, so toward that end, let me share the, for the idea of the curriculum and why it informs each of the programs and each individual affiliate's um, participation with the organization. Reconstruction's curriculum is designed for individuals, families, and community groups in and out of institutions. We believe that each human being is a sacred, is sacred, and is valuable to themselves, family, and community, and to society. Each of us needs to be critical thinkers, be good decision makers, and give principled leadership to our family and eventually change the world. This curriculum has three pillars, is interactive and transformative. Three pillars I simply share with you briefly, focusing on leadership development, each individual has leadership potential within them. The organization seeks to nurture that potential, put individuals in, in, in circumstances where that potential can be realized. Um, situation management, also known as crisis management, when crises arrive in, for an individual's life, within the household, within the community, um, loss of job, domestic violence, um, form of personal or uh, interpersonal violation. Um, how does one respond in the moment informed by principal leadership? Um, the second pillar focuses on the answer to that question. Third pillar is support group management, support group development. At the local level, one is informed by the company one keeps. <laughs> What is the strength and value of the collab of the social ties one establishes and seeks to maintain? The organization doesn't, doesn't, doesn't it's not a, it's not a, I won't even use that word. Um, it, it seeks to nurture healthy top social ties so that individuals further affiliations that are growth promoting and that affirm the best within themselves as they seek to realize the best within those other social ties. Three pillars, leadership development, um, situation management and support group development. Okay. Um, now, a little bit about each of the three programs that go to the details of which um, go into, excuse me, which the book goes into great detail regarding each of the three. A little bit of overview on a representation of the organization. Fight for Lifers. Fight for Lifers focuses on exactly what it would suggest. Individuals who will never see the light of day. In Pennsylvania, life means life. Individuals sentenced to life imprisonment um, have, by definition of the ruling, um, have abdicated their um, access to any form of parole. So they, they're, it's, it's pine box. Um, and so the pro that, that is a profound weight, a profound weight on spouses, sisters, mothers, grandmothers. And Fight for Lifers has as its primary mission to bring individuals who are in fellowship with individuals serving life into fellowship with one another so that they can be supportive of one another. Those individuals maintain ties with the lifers themselves, um, and interested in others are also supported. So, a little, little bit of representation. Um, a fight for lifer member. Oh, sorry. So I need to go back. Page 174 to give you a feel for fight for lifers. The mission of Fight for Lifers is to educate, 
is to educate the public about the realities of serving a life sentence in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the necessity for consideration of people of parole review for life sentenced prisoners on a case by case basis to provide support throughout the commutation process for individual lifers who have proven their merit to provide information, support, and guidance for their loved ones and to advocate for their special needs and the equality, excuse me, and the quality of life issues facing lifers and their families. Just a quick comment on commutation. Commutation is the process where one applies for recognition in the eyes of the court, either for a revisitation to the sentence, a revoking of that sentence, and or a new trial. Formal commutation is the removal of the sentence. Um, and one can apply for commutation. A lot of what Fight for Life does is assist individuals in that application process. And since the vast majority of them are denied, um, dealing with the emotions and the rage um, that is a part of both the acts that led that family member to be given the life sentence in the first place, from a restorative justice standpoint, taking responsibility, um, as well as the emotions and dynamics that inform um, the process of having to live with that challenge as a family member outside. Fight for Lifers. An example of the outcomes of Fight for Lifers in action. The experiences of one member um, Ms. Jamila Oprah. Um, while engaged with others who have been involved in reconstruction, I've developed a voice and I knew I had. And I took that voice and extended it to my family. Some who were incarcerated. I didn't know how to do that in the past. Once I became part of reconstruction, it really shaped me and developed me into a stronger woman. Definitely into an actress. And also, I'm not so quick to judge others. That's how reconstruction has helped me. Fight for lifers. The mechanics of its engagement rooted in real boring stuff. The process of actual commutation application. But also really inspiring transformative stuff. Grandmothers raising their grandchildren because the daughter has been sentenced to life supporting both that grandmother and those grandchildren um, as they navigate familiarly the costs and challenges of the absent mother. Um, so it's, 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 it's legal, it's structural, it's intimate and familial, it's a dynamic process and a fascinating program within the body of the organization. Fight for life. Um, AEA is Alumni Ex-Offenders Association. Alumni Ex-Offenders Association what I think of as the core of the organization, um, individuals who are former felons, their family members, and interest in others. Um, so, within the Alumni Ex Offenders Association, um, the focus is often on that emotional intelligence that I made reference to earlier that William discussed in the excerpt that I shared. Being emotionally aware with oneself, one's interpersonal exchanges, and one's environment. And then through fellowship and feedback, using what is understood as basically a therapeutic community approach. Sorry to use a jargony term. Basically, therapeutic community formally is a strategy. Um, a guy named Deleon um, is, is the primary innovator of it. A psychologist who did some wonderful work with individuals ch uh, ch challenged by mental, mental wellness challenges. And so when you come into mental wellness environments, come into a community of support. Um, Sorry, I think in movie terms that I was going to give a movie. One for the cuckoo's nest, is that still on purchase? Okay, okay, good, okay. So one for the cuckoo's nest is sort of like, like the worst of a therapeutic community going bad, right? Because we know Nurse Ratchet and all that kind of stuff. But the idea of the circle, the stuff, I, I use it as a point of reference because it's culturally familiar, um, and hopefully I had purchase. That circle 
that is so, such. I, I watched a segment of, of Jack Nich the Jack, Jack Nicholson character the other day being introduced to that circle. Of music. I'm sorry, I'm not going on that tangent. I'm talking for a point. AEA is rooted in the idea of the therapeutic community, the, the role of the sacred circle, and shared decision making, informing um, multiple assets and information that individuals, each individual bring. Remember, so they were presented with the challenge of one particular individual, and then Nurse Ratchet went to every single one. Do you have a comment on this? Do you have a comment on this? Now, it was, it was very hierarchical. So it wasn't the, the true sacred circle model that is used in AEA, where there's shared fellowship and shared leadership that's non-hierarchical. Um, but I just use that as a little metaphor. Point, therapeutic community is a model. Um, and just a demonstration of the way in which AEA engages and nurtures outcome. One AEA member suggested the following. Um, Carl, actually I can use his real name because it's presented as his real name in the book, Cameron. I'm a longtime AEA member and an SF, a co-founder of AEA. I really got into AEA. I really enjoyed coming to the meetings, talking about what was going on, and if I had a struggle, I didn't have a problem with coming, sitting down with whoever, whatever members was there, and discuss, discuss what was going on, and take some suggestions, and get the feedback and reveal that idea that I was um, looking for. Because it wasn't nothing I had to hide. I don't feel that any problem I have is too great to ask for help. You cannot get nowhere in life thinking you know everything. And it can only begin to describe the power of these kinds of exchanges. Grown men, thug to the hilt, lived a life of that form and version of hyper-masculine mask. Being in an environment of support that is salient enough to them at the level of spirit to be willing to engage in this kind of transformation. Powerful to, to watch, especially when you can watch people's arc of change across months and years. Just, just fascinating stuff. AEA, Alumni Ex Offenders Association, on the second of three programs in the organization. And then lead, so fight for life is focused on the folks who will never get out. AEA for the folks who do come out and lead the primary prevention, to use um, the the public health approach, the primary prevention arm of the organization because it's focused on youth. Okay. Um, youth, the children of the folks who are locked up, and youth who are already engaged in the school to prison pipeline, which has tentacles that are that feel like they're growing stronger and stronger with each policy decision. I mean, anyway, so whether they're youths who are caught up in the system or youths who are children of current or former films. Um, that's lead. Leadership, education, advocacy, and development. Um, let's see. Oh, and let me share from the book one lead moment. At one of its examples, um, William was walking around the neighborhood and saw a bunch of young boys um, taking plywood off of an abandoned house. Um, that neighborhood, like many neighborhoods of concentrated poverty in many urban cities, um, has lots of abandoned houses. Um, and several years ago, there were the, the, these kids were taking wood off the house. The, um, actually, that well, let me. I'll talk about the clubhouse in just a second. Let me get to let me get to what initiated it in the first place. The third youth initiative in reconstruction began when a chance observation became a means of structuring youth energy and effort. One day in the winter of 2001, <coughs> William saw a group of young boys from the neighborhood searching for old plywood. Rather than scolding them in the moment, or worse yet, scolding them and then reporting what he had seen to a parent or guardian, he engaged them about their motives and intended use of the wood. A vital dimension of nurturing sanctuary is meeting a rich diversity of persons where they are. Complete 
with their motives and actions. William learned that their goal was to build a fort. A fort. One among the most universal and transcendent boyhood activities that ever existed. I won't ask for arms of folks who, were, you know, who, who didn't participate in building a fort. Right. Um, so William then suggested a couple of alternatives for the boys to consider. Other wood they could secure. Other means to secure it and other ways they could collectively achieve their fort building goal. And with those alternatives, before any formal, excuse me, before any formal organizing began, a youth-oriented initiative under the guidance of Reconstruction. Patrick Murray, a longtime affiliate um, of the organization, an Ivy League trained master's degree architect, contractor, and master carpenter, is the original longtime Reconstruction member. Patrick guided these young men in the building of that clubhouse, which is, by the way, right next door, just north um, of William's actual home um, on Uber Street in North Philadelphia. As Patrick recounts, the clubhouse evolved by the kids themselves. They were tearing boards off of vacant homes to make a clubhouse, and William stopped them and said, no, 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 let's do this instead. Let's make a clubhouse, but you've got to get organized first. So William used it as an opportunity to teach organization skills. Six, the youngest was six years old through about 14. The oldest, the oldest at the time was about 14. Um, let's build some organization skills. How to show up. How to organize themselves. How to run a meeting. How to let everybody give their input and so forth. What could be understood as juvenile delinquency, or an act of juvenile delinquency, instead become, sorry, could still be understood as that, if, if one chose that label. But it turned into an initiative, a means through which individuals could collectively organize and, and end up building that structure, which still stands to this day. Um, and now it has a, has a a fence in front of it, they did a bunch of painting of it. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a fascinating example of the means through which um, a happenstance meeting can turn into a moment of transformation. Now, here's the, here's the downside. Two of the individuals who were instrumental in the construction of that, one is serving 10 to, 10 to 25 for a violent crime, and another is serving time for a sex offense. So the nature of this process of, 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 of transformation does happen. Lots of lives were changed, including on the part of those two individuals. But it doesn't necessarily work have a 100% success rate of intended principal transformation. Just want to acknowledge that some of you might, might be saying, well, what about, what about? Yeah. Lots, of, lots of diverse outcomes. Tons of positive ones, but some um, problematic ones as well. <coughs> LEAD, Leadership, Education, Advocacy, and Development. Throughout, LEAD provides a safe space for youth um, in a moment of movement, moment of vandalism became uh, a collective leadership. Um, in the moment of return subgroup capacity building, I won't exemplify for the sake of time. Okay. Um, actually, how am I doing on time? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so reconstruction can be understood as having established and maintained a pedagogy of the spirit. And this book explores the way in which that pedagogy, sorry, pedagogy is um, systems of information exchange, teaching and learning. And thus, a pedagogy of the spirit is a means through which the shared fellowship of information furthers and nurtures that soul force that Reverend Dr. King spoke of. Um, one could frame it in religious terms, secular terms, whatever. It, it's, the, it's that force within us all. Um, and, and Reconstruction engages in that pedagogy of the spirit. Let me share a comment with you to demonstrate from the book the way in which that is articulated. So saying a pedagogy of principal transformation, reconstruction is established and maintain a pedagogy of the spirit, a pedagogy of critical consciousness, a, 
critical pedagogy, an emancipatory process of profound transformation. This chapter and indeed this book explore the meaning, methods, and mechanisms of these concepts and relationships by analyzing the past, present, and possible future of the curriculum that has been its pedagogical foundation, those three pillars that I spoke of earlier. These foundations from the, from the original themes to its current pillars are the outline for the strategies of action that nurture principal transformation by building the capacity of its membership and all others who have ever come into contact with it, individually, familially, communally. Three programs of addressing three different family center challenges. Fight for Lifers, Alumni Ex Offenders Association, LEAD. Three pillars of a capacity building curriculum, which inform and structure, drive the foundation, strategies of action, patterns of engagement, formal and informal, um, that, uh, within each of those programs. Every meeting, three levels of principal transformation in, emphasize individual, familial, communal, and beyond. And it is that process um, that is that through that process and through the repetitive engagement and utility of those, of that trio of trios, principal transformation happens. Rage is reconstructed and the nursery of crime free lives exists. One statistic that I want to share, just because I've already shared a negative one. Um, the, the initial reconstruction effort, which has gone into a great detail, was an in-prison initiation in the greater, at SCI Greaterford Prison, one of the oldest prisons, I believe, the, one of the, if not the, the oldest prison in the United States, one of the first three ever established. It's still functioning, Greaterford Prison, SCI Greaterford. And we went into SCI Greaterford under the late Donald Vaughn, may he rest in peace, um, who was the um, superintendent of the prison at the time, superintendent of the prison system, George Stahalik, who we went to meet with. Let me make a long story short. Bottom line is, we got into SCI Greaterford. Reconstruction. Lifers, no, um, normally under, um, under st um, um, state and federal statute, other prisons can, prisoners cannot make decisions about some other prisoner. But we were in a position to collaboratively build a shared leadership environment such that Director Stahalik, Superintendent Stahalik, Warden um, Donald Vaughn, joined us in allowing lifers to be the primary decision makers in forming who among the individuals who were two-time felons facing their third strike, three strikes and you have life, Two-time felons, which two-time felons who had yet to secure the third strike would be the primary participants in the first cohort. Lifers played a key decision-making role. Just that process, I can only begin to describe, it was absolutely fascinating. It was, I, was, I was in a way in Seattle in graduate school, but it was really cool to hear and be updated as, as regularly as I could. And I got to Philly as, as, as often as I could. Um, so, point. We come to a cohort, 24 individuals. Five-year recidivism rate. Of those 24, three were rearrested, only one for a new crime. Five-year recidivism rate, where 21 out of 24 <coughs> maintained crime-free lives. That's the principal transformation that Reconstruction um, has contributed to. Okay, a little overview of current initiatives just to give you a sense of what's going on right now, right now, right now on the ground. Um, within Fight for Lifers, the ongoing structure, the ongoing strategy and challenges of assisting, other indiv assisting individuals in applying for and navigating the clemency process, um, and advocating, we formally can't lobby, but advocating um, uh, state legislators and the like. Um, for as a 501c3, you're formally not supposed to lobby. 
um, so we can advocate strongly and be in fellowship with, with politicians um, to further their awareness uh, of the potential for legislation that allows for life with the possibility of parole. Um, bills have been introduced and shot down, introduced and shot down, and that process continues. But the effort remains as well. Um, alumni Acts and Fenders Associated current initiatives include uh, political forums, hosting political forums, because as we know, um, um, individuals who have served time in, within Pennsylvania, as soon as you are off paper, as soon as you are off probation or parole, you again can apply for um, voting privileges. Pennsylvania is one of the states that allow you to, only two states permanently revoke your voting privilege with felonious conviction, and only two states allow individuals, including current felons, to vote, Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, so let, let's, let's get on the Vermont, New Hampshire man. Um, anyway, um, so the, the effort on the part of AEA is to explore various forms of citizen engagement, including of voter participation. And there will, a thing that I really could spend the whole time talking about, an entrepreneurial collaboration with faculty members in the business school at Villanova University. Um, where, because the, the key thing for this transformation is about jobs. People need to work. Um, and one of the ways in which, sorry, through affiliation of Business School Affiliates, Mr. Ronald Hill, Chair Professor in, uh, at Villanova in, its, in their business school, um, is assisting in the development of entrepreneurial initiatives, including the application for small business loans um, and the furthering, so that former felons have the opportunity to build business and renewable, legal, um, economic needs um, to, to support themselves and their families. And leadership education advocacy and development um, Noble Pillars is an initiative where they're, they're seeking out, it's, a, it's an LLC, a limited liability corporation, within uh, the program of reconstruction. The effort is to get young men and women um, to look over neighborhood properties and to start the process of, for those abandoned buildings that are city-owned, start the process of applying for them. Take ownership of those properties, gain skills through Patrick Murray and others who have contracting and carpentry skills in the process of refurbishing property, so they're developing their skill base in that regard, and in, in the process of establishing properties that will be a renewable income source for individuals and the organizations. No pillars. And then they're also participating in an entrepreneurial partnership with ABA members, which includes a storefront that the well, bit of a convolute, that the spouse of a brother of a ABA member has access to. And we're going to turn it into I'm, I'm, you know the, the whole spoken word thing is is it a I'm not young enough to know, but it's in an un uncertain place. But the goal is to turn it into a spoken word spot. Um, and, and, and basically a part, a rentable party joint. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of see how that goes. So um, that, that's also on, on the way. Um, so set of initiatives of various forms across all three programs, always driven by former felons, their family members, and interested others. Okay, a couple reasons for hope that I'll just, um, reasons for hope. Macro indicators of support for the possibility of the decline of mass incarceration. Go Governor Schwarzenegger, I won't get into his personal politics, but as he, on, his, uh, on his way out, his last State of the State address, he had the wisdom to raise the symbolic question, what does it say about any state that focuses more on prison uniforms than on caps and numbers? And he gave set stats behind it. People are starting to leave, so they get to it because I've cleared them. Um, we're starting to close prisons. That's a great thing. Then the question is, how can those prisons be retrofitted? So this media coverage in the Atlantic focuses on the retrofitting of prisons. Um, and so there's an initiative going on which Reconstruction is starting the process of affiliating with that addresses this contribution. But the bottom line is they're closing. Another indicator that I didn't put up here, caliber, 
Colorado and Washington voters have the wisdom to legalize marijuana. And I am, I am, I am all for a substance-free life person. <laughs> However, the drug war is a farce that we all know. We will get into the dynamics of it. We will get into the dynamics of it if you like. And any initiative at the state referendum level that reduces the farce of the drug war is a good thing. Reasons for hope in the decline of mass incarceration. Conclusion. Okay. And for all of these, whatever one's life station or current place, interested in knowing or nurturing a new justice substantially more equitable than what has historically been and what currently exists, we invite your creativity to experiment with new and unexpected modes of organizing that challenge the conventional civil rights organizing and be willing to make mistakes. In that spirit, we hope that you risk thoughtfully, as William did in challenging hundreds of strangers in 1988. We hope that you enter unexpected alliances, as Warden Donald Vaughn did in seeing an unknown yet possible value in inviting reconstruction into greater for prison. We hope that you sustain innovative commitments as Phyllis Joan Carter, Anita Colon, Lucinda Hudson, Hakeem Ali, Patrick Murray, May Hadley, and others have across their years of care and commitment and affiliation with the Reconstruction and their abiding faith in its organizational possibilities. And we hope that you reconstruct your own outrage toward realizing a new and very different justice from what we know today. Thanks for your time and attention.